Okay, this is the uh, uh, Micro One uh, lecture for the 20th of October. Um, okay, so uh, uh, so let's look at the uh, syllabus, and here we are, the 20th, talking about interfacing high power devices, transistors, motors, uh, demonstrate the solid state relay. So I'll do that today. Um, and then uh, on Thursday, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the practicum coming up next week. I haven't figured out how I'm going to do that. I might even cancel it. Uh, but anyway, we'll see. Uh, I'm planning on doing something. I may make it really simple, but anyway. So, so stand by. I'll hopefully have it figured out by Thursday. Uh, okay, so this weekend, we're going to do Lab 10, not Lab 8. And uh, you're going to need the 2x16 LCD uh, display with the I2C interface. And I, I do have enough for everybody to check one out. Uh, the students that got them mailed to, to them on eBay can keep them, um, kind of as a gift, really, because I, 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 we didn't charge you enough to cover the cost of everything. But that's OK. I wanted to make it affordable. And uh, also, uh, uh, I knew that it would might be difficult for some of you to mail them back in. And, and the cost of postage is about the cost of this stupid thing, and so it's not really worth it. But, um, but you have them. So all 20 of you who got them on eBay, you have all the parts you need. And everybody else needs to pick up the, uh, the I2C. So I'll make sure I bring some in tomorrow to the DSD lab at 11.30 and on Wednesday to the DSD lab at uh, 2 p.m. And so you can come by lab, the DSD labs and pick them up. Uh, you can sign them out and then basically uh, just turn them back in at the end of the semester. Um, because I, I need to use them for next semester. Otherwise, I have to pay another, you know, four dollars a piece for them. Um, and uh, and then you can use it not only for the upcoming lab, but you can also use it for your final project. Uh, because for your final project, you either have to use the two line base sixteen display, or you have to use uh, uh, the the UART. You already have the 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 uh, UART to USB uh, dongle. And you can use that, or you can use, or you can use both. Um, and so I do encourage. So I, but I, I think it's a, it's a, certainly a good experience to, to to do a project that includes the uh, two line by sixteen display. Um, and we'll talk about that. I'll probably talk about that on on Friday on Thursday. I'll go over that. I'll demonstrate that basically. Okay. So uh, so that's what's coming up. And then, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll tell you about the practicum on Thursday. Right now, I'm, I haven't really figured it out. And I, I may either cancel it, move it, or do it. And if we do it, then that's going to come down on a week from this coming Thursday. So it'll be the 27th. So I don't know. Uh, no, I take it back. It's, uh, it's, that, it's, next, it's a week from tomorrow, or a week from Tuesday. Okay. Um, all right. So that pretty well covers that. Uh, so I did want to. Uh, hmm. So that should be. I don't guess I. I didn't. Oh, I did. I made a small change. Okay, that's fine. All right, and the uh, and the uh, syllabus on the web is updated. All right. So first, I'm going to talk about the uh, photoresistor. Uh, you used it in the lab last week, or at least you you could have used it. Uh, and uh, I don't I don't know if the lab actually required that or not, uh, but it was one of it's one of the features on that on that uh, device. And I, I might I might do something on the practicum with the photoresistor. So that's another reason why why I'm going to cover it. But I, I just want you to under, you know see see about how it works. It's very simple. So it's just going to take a second to do this. All right. So the photoresistor uh, it looks like this. Okay. Um, it has it, it's actually a completely passive device. So it, it has no active elements in it at all. Uh, it has two electrodes, and then uh, it has these uh, these cold well contacts at the top, and then they it has this this interdigitating interface between the first electrode and the uh, second electrode, and then there's a clear there's a clear coating over the top of it. There's a photoconductive material over the top surface. So what happens when light shines? on the top surface, it changes uh, its electrical conductivity, or its resistance, basically. And, um, 
and so that allows that allows uh, this resistance to change. So now we have to set up a circuit that allows us to basically measure this resistance change. Now the couple things, well, well, we'll get to this in a minute. Uh, so here's what it looks like next to a quarter, and you've seen it. It's on your little analog board, uh, as you know. It's very small, and uh, you just expose this to light, and you'll get a change in resistance. Make it completely dark, you'll you'll get a fairly high resistance between the two electrodes. And make it as very bright, a, a high as in oh maybe 500, uh, maybe 500 uh, uh, kilo ohms. 500k ohms, make it really, really bright, you may get the resistance down to 2 to 5k ohms. So it, that's a pretty big drop, a couple of orders of magnitude potentially. Uh, so yeah, about 200k and then very light down to say 5, 5 to 10. It usually is below 10. But one of the interesting features about these is the devices can have 50% variation between the same batch. So that even though you they were made at the same time, uh, they 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 don't have the exact same responsiveness. So you kind of have to uh, you have to have some pretty wide latitude when it comes to thresholds and stuff for uh, for ambient light measurements. There are some other things out there that we use all the time. We use photovoltaic cells, and uh, we also use phototransistors. Now phototransistors can be pretty sensitive because we. Uh, we basically uh, we can have an active component, and and the light can affect um, how much uh, you know can affect uh, the flow of current through the transistor uh, pretty dramatically. Whereas a photocell actually generates a, a is it is it completely inactive device? Uh, well, it's an active device, but it's but it requires no power, and it it actually generates electricity, and so we can measure that. Uh, but the photoresistor doesn't generate electricity. You have to actually uh, run uh, a, a, some sort of uh, current through it in order to use it to sense. Um, and there are lots and lots of applications. One of the really nice things, um, oh, I did want to show this, this lightness thing. Uh, we, we talk about uh, brightness or illuminance in terms of lux. And uh, so when you're out a moonless clear night sky will be uh, something like 0 0.002 lux. And if you, uh, if you, your minimum amount that's required for emergency lighting, you, you have to have at least 0 0.2 lux. Full moon on a clear night can get up to a quarter to, a, to one lux. And then a, uh, the, uh, when we talk about the uh, civil twilight, Civil twilight ends when you get down to 3.4 lux. Um, and that, a typical family living room, about 50 lux. A typical hallway or a toilet, a bathroom, uh, 80 lux. Uh, outside on a very dark overcast day, 100 lux. Sunrise or sunset on a clear day, our well-lit office area, 300 to 500 lux. And finally, uh, overcast uh, day, but not not the very dark day, but just a little bit of, you know, cloud cover, a thousand lux, or a typical TV studio lighting, about a thousand lux. Full daylight, but not in the direct sunlight, 10,000 to 25,000, and actual direct sunlight, 32 to 130,000 lux. So you can see, look at the numbers of orders of magnitude that we go through here, uh, almost nine orders of magnitude. Well, nine, nine orders of magnitude. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, and the, the eye is very much a logarithmic sensor, so that's it's good to keep that in mind. Okay, uh, so the uh, the applications for this photoresistor, first off, they're super cheap. They're very very inexpensive. Uh, uh, so so you can so they're one of the cheapest little components you can ever you can ever pick up. And so you might use them uh, to sense turning pages in a child's book. I don't know if any of you have read books to children where when you open a page it plays a little jingle um, or whatever based on what page you're open to and that's one of the ways it can do that. It, it can use photoresistors to sense the uh, ambient light. Uh, you can use them to adjust screen brightness automatically. Uh, some cell phones will do that. In a bright room they'll, they'll become brighter. In a dim room they'll, they'll get dimmer because there's a little photoresistor somewhere 
Um, you could also use a photocell or phototransistor, but those are more expensive. And, uh, and one of the problems is that there is this inherent variation between parts, even in the same batch. So, so you do have to kind of make sure that you uh, have an adequate cushion in your design as the parts vary all over the place that you still get the behavior you want. Uh, they can definitely be used in dark to dawn switches. Um, and with calibration, uh, you, can, um, you can use them uh, quite nicely, uh, reading them in through your, a, your, your uh, a to D port and adjusting thresholds. And you can definitely calibrate them too, so that then they actually could be used to measure things. Um, OK, let's see. I think that may be all I wanted to say about that. Yeah. OK, so let me get rid of this. And we'll do this one. All right. So what if, what if we have our microprocessor and we want to control some, um, some more powerful devices besides an LED, say? And even some LEDs might take a lot of power. So what if we want to control a super bright or, or an array of super bright LEDs? Well, we can't really do it directly from, uh, from our pin uh, on our microprocessor because our microprocessor is limited to 25 milliamps syncing or sourcing. And that's, and, and that's also, uh, we're limited to a total budget for the whole board of about 80 milliamps. So, so that's not even four pins syncing their maximum current or sourcing their maximum current. So we do have to pay attention to these current limitations. So if you want to control some really high power device, well, we're going to have to have something uh, that's more than our, just the output pin of our microprocessor. Also, voltage is a limit. Our microprocessor runs on some you know, VDD voltage. In our case, 3.3 or 5. The max for this chip is 5.5. So if you want to control 9 volts, you, now you've got to use something else anyway. You can't drive it straight off a pin. All right. So, uh, well, we can't. the reason we can't just use the GPIO pins, as I just said, uh, a lot of, well, AC devices, our, our board runs on DC, 3.3 volts or maybe 5 volts DC. You certainly can't power an AC device on 3.3 volts of DC. And a lot of our DC devices take more than 3.3 volts or 5 volts. Um, the other thing is we would like to have some, some isolation from our logic circuits to the high voltage circuits. We don't want, we don't want our logic circuits uh, getting zap, zapped with big voltage spikes from, uh, from say, a, a motor generating lots of noise. So we want, and for safety, we may, our, our low power stuff may have touch switches and other things that are getting very close to humans. And we don't want, you know, we don't want thousands of volts uh, running, you know, perilously close to the touch of a finger, say. So, so there's lots of reasons why we, we want this isolation. All right, so one of the things we can do is look at, uh, at the uh, input max low and max high voltages. And I think I already did this. Uh, we talked about this before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But remember, uh, we do have a, a register that selects whether we use a, a TTL or a SMIT trigger uh, input levels on our various pins. And <clears throat> depending on what we're running our board at for VDD, uh, drives when we, sit, when we call an input a low voltage, or a zero, or when we call an input a high voltage, or a one. And so this is just off the data sheet, and you can reference this uh, if you're uh, interfacing to something that's maybe not getting quite all the way to, to your operating voltage, like 3.3 or 5 volts, and you want to know, is this going to be read correctly? And, and you're not sure, good time to go to the data sheet and just uh, uh, do the calculation. OK, um, there are also some other minimum ratings here to pay attention to. Temperatures, total power dissipation, but notice this, maximum current out of the ground pin on the chip, 85 milliamps. And uh, and that's for the, uh, the, the normal temperature 
uh, range part. For the extended temperature range part, it, the budget's even lower, 35 milliamps, because when you, they're 125 degrees centigrade, you have to be careful about how much current you let run through it, and it'll push it over into the fail range. And then the maximum current into your power pin, and it's 80 milliamps. So you do have a little bigger sink budget than you do a source budget for this chip, only five milliamps, but it's a little bigger. Uh, and that's kind of typical of most micros. Some micros have a, a much greater uh, differential there. Um, okay, and then per pin, 25 milliamps uh, can be sunk, 25 milliamps can be sourced. Those are the max values. Yeah, and then continuous plus or minus 20 milliamps for our clamp current. All right. It's also important to notice that there, there are some frequency considerations. I think I've talked about this too. Uh, but, the, but if you want to run it at the full 32 megahertz, you have to be above 2.5 volts uh, for your operating voltage. So even though the chip will run at 1.8 volts, it will not run at 1.8 volts at 32 megahertz. It will only run at 1.8 volts up to 16 megahertz. So you have some settings in there you can only use if you go up to at least, well, 2.5 or, or better. Okay, at 3.3, of course, everything's fine. All right, so uh, one of the other things is how, how accurate is, our, is the frequency of our internal oscillator? Uh, and it depends a little bit on, on temperature. So if it's operating in the normal room temperature range, it's like plus or minus 2%. If it gets real cold or gets a little bit hot, it degrades, and it gets a lot hot, it degrades even further. And then uh, we've talked about this, but only briefly, but I, I, I do want you to keep in mind that, we, that for LEDs, we always have to have some current limiting resistors. Uh, if you don't, because uh, it's just a diode, and although it has some internal resistance and a voltage drop across it, if you give it 5 volts and there's no current limiting resistor and your 5 volt source can provide, you know, uh, hundreds of milliamps and maybe, an, maybe even an amp or two, uh, it, the LED will draw enough current to blow itself out or to get so hot that it will not function correctly uh, very well in the future. Uh, sometimes they will continue to function a little bit. They just degrade, but sometimes they just flash for a fraction of a second and they're totally destroyed. So you do need to, uh, do need to observe these voltage limits. Now these current limiting resistors, I guess strictly speaking, uh, probably should be carefully sized for each color LED because the, there's a different voltage drop depending. Blue and white can drop 3.5 volts even, uh, although the blue, our blue works fine at 3.3 volts, so, I'm, so it, it must not drop that much. But, uh, but the old red, green, and yellow were about one to one and a half volts. But the, the newer ones, the blue ones, the white ones, uh, maybe even the, uh, you know, maybe orange ones, I don't know, different colors can, can have a little bit different voltage drop. So you, for a standard LED, you want maybe 20 milliamps, but that actually will make it pretty bright. The super bright LEDs take a little more current. And, uh, and again, uh, th there is a different voltage drop across them based on the, the color of LED it is. Um, Make sure that your output pin can sync or source the required current, and um, and 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 then uh, calculate what the voltage drop is across the LED, and then subtract that from your drive voltage, and you can begin to figure out what size what size uh, at a give at 20 milliamps what size resistor you need to drop the remaining voltage, and that's a good rough starting point, and then you can down down downgrade it a little bit. So that you don't have, uh, so you're not pushing the LEDs to their limit. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can use uh, GPIO pins uh, to uh, detect, uh, like if uh, liquids and ice, you can use them directly to sense things like that. You you can uh, you can write software and create uh, using software. Uh, you can use a GPIO pin and basically. Uh, generate your own interface protocol if you don't have a de dedicated module for it. And lots of other uh, applications for these things. 
Well, one of the things that we want to do is uh, we have this thing called Open Collector Outputs, and this is what we use for our I squared C interface. And uh, I'm going to talk about I'll talk about I squared C in more detail later, so I'm not going to get totally bogged down here. But I but I squared C uses an open collector, and the way this works, we have a transistor set up an MPN, and uh, and when the uh, or a FET, and and the uh, the the drive from the microprocessor or the integrated circuit uh, comes to the base, and then uh, we can pull this, we can pull the open collector line down, but if if our transistor is cut off, then this open collector is just floating. And so what we do is we tie an external pull up to this uh, of a few k. Uh, I think the one we have on our board is 4k or 3.98k or something like that. And and it, and so that pulls it up. But you can have several other open collectors hooked to that same line, and then any one of them can pull that line down by turning on its transistor. And then if more than one of them are pulling the line down, that's fine. That doesn't cause any trouble. Uh, so it's a really good way to, to run a bus. It gives us a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, ability to, to hook multiple things. It's kind of a poor man's bus. So instead of having to use uh, tri-state buffers to connect, we, we can have everybody connected to the open collector bus. And then uh, nobody, pulls it, nobody pulls it up. It's pulled up by the pull-up transistor. But anybody can pull it down without causing a short circuit. And everybody can pull it down without causing a, sharp, a short circuit. Uh, but normally we just, you know, uh, we, we usually want just one person running the bus. Then the way we do that is you let the bus, you let the bus float high and then you read it, and if it's not high, you know somebody else is pulling it down. So that's a good way to deconflict the bus. All right. And this also lets it be bidirectional. Sometimes we'll use transistors as digital switches. Uh, obviously, we use them on the integrated circuits that are part of our ICs, um, although we're probably using CMOS. But, uh, but we can use a PNP or an MPN, either one. You do have a two transistor switch on your board. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna, I'll show that. Let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that bigger. Let's see, I'm gonna move this over here and switch the camera. Oh, I didn't turn it on. Turn it on. And then, so, uh, and what I wanna show is, so if you look at your board, you know this green terminal. So there's a little two input uh, female header here. The both pins are tied together. So if you drive one of those pins high, then it turns on. There's two transistors in here, which are actually pretty hard to see. Let me zoom in on it, see if you can see them. Uh, let's see. It's maybe we can't. Maybe we can. Yeah. So one of them is right here. And I think that's the uh, NPN, and the other one is right here, and that's the PNP. And then we have these these uh, four resistors that sort of bias these uh, and protect the base, change the base current and things like that. We actually drive this ba the base of this transistor through this uh, 50k ohm uh, resistor, and then this transistor drives the base of this transistor through one of these 10ks. And so it, it's, it's set up so that, it, that almost no matter how good or how poorly you drive the first transistor, you will fully turn on the other one. Uh, and so you'll get, a, you'll get whatever you have going into your uh, battery input here. Whatever you have going into your battery input, you'll have that appear on this pin and ground will be on the other pin. And if you drive this high, then you'll have battery voltage applied. If you drive this low, or, or, or you pull out the pin and you don't drive it at all, you let it float, it'll be low. All right, so, so that's that. So that's your two transistor switch. And it'll probably, it'll support, it'll support more than nine volts of the nine volt battery. Uh, it'll probably go up to, I don't know, maybe 15, maybe 20, something like that, 20, 25, maybe 30 volts, something like that. And it'll, it'll, you can, push about uh, 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 more than, a little more than 100 milliamps through it, maybe 150, uh, maybe for a short time 200, 
but if uh, if you go much more than that you will blow it and we we have had these transistors blow right off the board uh, just explode uh, pop really is what they do if you try and put you know a couple of amps through they don't like that okay so let me switch this back down and I'll switch it back to me okay all right now um, all right, I, I'm going to just say a couple of things about this. We will have a lab later on, uh, hopefully, that will do the transistors. I, I, I didn't give parts to the, uh, to the, to the students, um, so it's not a big deal. I, I may not even do this lab. We may just do it as a demonstration lab, but if you want to do it, uh, there are parts in the, uh, in the lab that you can, you can check out and use. Um, or you, can, you probably have some cheap transistors around. Um, the ones we use, 2N3904 and 3906, those are the two that are on your, your Viva board. Um, and they give us, they're rated theoretically at 200 milliamps, but I'm telling you, they get pretty hot at that, that, that current, so they won't last long. So try and keep it to 100, 150 at the most. The, uh, you can use, there are more powerful BJTs in different packages that can definitely draw more current. Uh, you can definitely, though, handle the higher voltage load with these parts. These, these parts will go up. I forget. I didn't put it on here. But I think they can go up to maybe almost 30 volts. Uh, so you can definitely increase the fan out for a pin using this technique. And it also gives you a little bit of additional protection for micro pin because you have this two transistor circuit and your connection to your micros back at the first of that two transistor setup. Now, you know, with thousands of volts on it, you probably could bleed through and just short everything out and get all the way back to the micro and destroy it but and these and these transistors are very inexpensive so when we want to normally when we control power to a device we have the option of switching the uh, the power leg or the ground leg so here's the load here was we here the top of the load is tied to power and we're switching the ground and here the uh, our, our switch is tied to the to the power and the bottom of the load is tied to ground so here we're switching the top of the load and here we're switching the ground connection now which of these do you think would be better which do you think we'd rather switch and the answer is we we'd, we'd always rather switch the top the top side so when the switch is off the the loads not connected to the power at all whereas in this one when the switch is off, the load's still connected to the power. It's just not grounded. And so you could touch the load and, uh, and experience, uh, you know, some of the, some of the applied voltage uh, and maybe enough to, to cause a real problem. So, so that's why we almost always switch uh, the top side. Like in a car, uh, we, we don't want to have the battery connected to all of our taillights all the time and just uh, take away the ground because... Um, you know, if you were fiddling with it, then you could be changing the bulbs and you could get it, you could short across it somehow and, and you'd have a big problem. What you normally want to do is turn off the bulb. Well, if you're, if you're turning off, just, just disrupted the ground connection, you'd still have all the power, all the battery power would be right there. Whereas if your switch actually turns off the battery power to the, to the fixture, then you don't have any power to the fixture. And you normally want to leave it grounded anyway. Uh, so, so we almost always want to switch the high side. Now for BJTs, it's not a problem because they're fairly symmetric. The PMPs and the MPNs have very similar, um, similar uh, uh, characteristics. But when we're using power FETs, that's a little different. The N-channel power FETs have uh, much better, uh, much lower on-channel resistance. So, for, so they can, for the same fairly high currents, they're going to dissipate much less heat than the... Uh, the p-channel devices which uh, have higher on on channel resistance and they will generate more heat for the same current um, so we normally in, in bjt's we'll just always want to get the a pmp and switch the high side uh, and there's a good way to connect them in a bad way so here is a npn in the ground side and here's a pmp well we don't we don't like this one because some of the current that goes through the base resistor that determines you know how 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 well we're able to turn put this thing into saturation some of that current is also flowing through the load 
and that's that's a that's a problem. Uh, if the load changes, then this current can change. What we really like is this setting here, where uh, well, it's really here, where we use a PMP in the high side, and our current flows through the through the the emitter base junction, and through the the base resistor but not through the load at all. So when the load changes, it doesn't change this current flow. Um, and so that's that's good. Whereas in if you put a NPN on the high side, then you see the, the current through your resistor does go through, the, your base resistor goes through your load. And so if the load were to change, that changes this current. It affects the performance of this, whether it's fully saturated or maybe not. Maybe it throws it into partial saturation and now you have more voltage dropped across it and greater heat production. It can cause problems. So we, we want, we, so the thing to remember is if you're going to use BJTs and you want to control the high, you want to switch the high side, use a PNP. If you're going to use BJTs and you want to switch to the low side, use an NPN. In the case of FETs, we should do the same thing, but it turns out we want to use an N-channel FET regardless, and so when we put the N-channel FET on the high side, we have to play some games because now we have a little problem. We have to, we have to get the gate uh, 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 higher than the source in order to turn it off uh, or to turn it on fully. And uh, Sorry, to turn it on fully. And to do that, uh, we may have 35 volts or something, 25 volts driving the... Uh, driving the source, and when we want to take the gate above that, now we've got to get up maybe even 10 volts above that, maybe to, to 35 volts. Well, where are we going to get the 35 volts of our power supplies at 25 volt supply? <laughs> so that's a problem. That's where bootstrap capacitors and other things are used to do to make this work. And and also um, also we we uh, we have uh, devices that uh, that uh, generate uh, um, generate these higher voltages. Fortunately, the amount of current needed at that higher voltage is infinitesimal, and so we can we can have these uh, these uh, uh, capacitor-based circuits to uh, to do charge pumping and to uh, to generate these higher voltages and make these things work. So we can use our our preferable N-channel FET in the high side. Okay, um, and here's this here's the schematic for our our switch. Here's the, uh, the, the two pin, t uh, here's your output. Here's the two pin uh, uh, female header. And so you drive this transistor on with a high and it drives this fully into saturation. This is the PNP output and it puts nine volts across here. So that would be the load. Okay, so that's one way we can get higher power devices. And, and the advantage over the single BJT is that it's more robust. It's just a more robust, good, healthy switch. Um, okay. So mechanical relays, what about them? Well, there are some downsides to mechanical relays. One of the things is they have a lot of noise because they, uh, they have a coil. And the coil always generates some voltage spike, so it has to be quenched with diodes. And it's a mechanical device. So they're failure modes. The contacts can get dirty. Um, often the specifications for most uh, diodes, or for, sorry, for most mechanical relays, uh, require you to have a certain amount of current flowing when you break the connection. And if you don't have that minimal current flowing, then there's not a little arc that's generated as the contacts separate to clean off the uh, the contact surfaces, and so then corrosion will build up. And if you didn't carefully review that data sheet and make sure you have that minimum current flowing most of the time when you break the circuit, then you're going to see that fail much faster than it's rated to be, that, than, than it's rated failure rate. And again, we also have to, to bring out these diodes uh, to uh, kill the back EMF on the coil. And then no matter how carefully you've, you've installed them, inspect them, and supported them with your circuit, they still have a limited lifetime. Um, now, one nice thing about relays is the, the contact resistance is extremely low. They can handle very, very high currents, and uh, they can handle reactive loads without any problems at all, which is a really nice, nice feature. And here's an example. Here's kind of what they look like. So you have a coil here. This coil is going to pull this, this arm into it. That arm is going to push up and take the two contacts here and make them close.
here's what they look like often uh, just a little black box like this uh, uh, these are maybe about the size of a quarter or less and you'll see these on lots and lots of uh, controller circuits uh, if you if your furnace stops your air conditioning or your furnace stops working and you want to know what's going on uh, one of the first things to check is to make sure uh, that your that your uh, one of the mechanical relays on the controller board uh, hasn't failed they they are often single pole double throw or double pole double throw contact arrangements uh, and they usually have a set of open uh, uh, normally open and a set of normally closed contacts um, you can usually uh, they usually have a little seal thing on the top that lets you uh, clean off the flux when you solder them on automatically uh, some flux type you know immersion cleanable and flux type versions are available um, so you do have to have some, a little bit of spacing uh, the uh, and of course the, you want the coil in here because it's across the power lines you want it to to be fairly robust and not likely to short out and and cause a fire or anything um, they're pretty low profile uh, 15 millimeters high coil sensitive just you know uh, the the coil does take 400 milliwatts to operate maybe as much as 80 milliamps at 5 volts so sometimes it's hard to drive these directly from a microprocessor pin so you, you may have to use a BJT on your microprocessor pin drive the BJT let the BJT drive this and then this can drive uh, quite a bit it, it a lot of times these contacts can uh, can you know have isolation of 10,000 volts and they can definitely uh, do 10 amps uh, at 220 277 volts so they can uh, they can be very good and they do provide quite a bit of isolation between the high powered contacts that you're switching and the and your coil that you're running with a maybe a, a BJT connected to your micro there's quite a bit of separate physical separation so that it's hard for the the high voltage high power to to actually have much effect on the uh, um, on the actual coil part a better choice uh, are these uh, these solid state relays a lot of people will call them hockey pucks a Crydon's one of the popular brands um, I think I've got a different brand here that I'm going to demonstrate in a minute and they're they come in all sorts of flavors and they're all about the same size on one side they have uh, they have an input and on the other side they have an output in this particular case they have 240 volts AC at 25 amps that you can control on the other side there uh, this is also controlled by AC and it's 90 to 280 volts uh, AC the current though on this side is going to be infinitesimal almost no current will be drawn to s turn this on and off let me let me sh let me do a better one here I I didn't realize I should fix this drawing but let me let me just for grins we'll pull up we'll pull up Bing and we'll pull up some images yeah so I'll say relay we'll do 20 amperes or whatever and you can see a whole bunch of them let me just pull up the pictures and they you can see they kind of look a lot of them do look kind of similar this is this is a better this is a good choice here let's see what this one actually looks like yeah so notice how this takes the input here is 3 to 32 volts DC and over here 240 volts AC at 25 amps so your little 3 volts and, and the amount of current draw is probably just a few milliamps and up here you can draw 25 amps now what's really nice uh, is that you can uh, you you have a great deal of isolation here because the way these work on the uh, on the contact end you're turning on a an LED that's shining across and controlling a photoresistor that's separated by maybe you know several centimeters and that 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 photo that uh, photo transistor then is turning on the solid state part of the relay 
which is a, a, a bunch of FETs or other things, SCRs, I don't know. They, they use different things to control AC. Some of these are set up to control DC. Um, but in any event, there's a tremendous amount of isolation because you're actually shining the light through several centimeters of distance. And that distance does provide, you know, thousands of volts of, uh, of isolation. So it's really nice. Um, it looks like this. You can see here's our, here's our photo transistor or diode in this side. And usually the photo transistor uh, drives a, a FET. So there's usually two stages over here. And here you just have a little, uh, little LED. And the current limiter may actually be incorporated into the circuit usually. And there's your, there's your output. Okay, um, so this isolation is really a nice feature of these devices. The other thing that's really nice is, guess what? No moving parts. So they're completely non-mechanical. And uh, the only thing that really takes them out is stuff like a huge voltage spike or lightning, that kind of thing, or, you know, getting whacked. <laughs> shot something like that they're, so they're pretty robust um, so usually there's a photodiode array so here's your here's your controller input where you just have this one little led that's it and so you, you're drawing very little current over here a few milliamps and then here's your and then between these two there's this all this isolation because there's usually a little cavity that separates these by a physical distance and uh and then Here's your photodiode array and your driver circuit, and then here your your output uh, MOS gates, and there's your load. Okay, so most of these solid state relays use this optical coupling, and uh, and the control voltage just ener energizes an internal LED, illuminates and switches on a photosensitive diode, and then uh, the diode current you know turn turn the diode current turns on a back-to-back -back, either a thyristor, SCR for AC loads, or a MOSFET for DC loads. And it does provide this very high uh, electrical isolation. Um, sometimes you need a helper circuit for rapid turn off of the FET. The AC circuits uh, turn off only on the zero crossing sometimes, which really helps uh, avoid uh, switching noise and arcs and stuff. And all the devices have a little bit of internal resistance compared to a relay that has very, very little internal resistance. You can pretty much only implement this, the uh, single pole, single throw compared to a relay that can have many, many poles and certainly double pole, double throw. So that's another shortcoming of these things. Um, they're usually smaller than relays. They make no noise. There's no bouncing. There's no arcs. So you can use them in explosive areas. They're not very sensitive to mechanical shock. You can take a relay and Hit it with the hit it with your screwdriver, and you can make the contacts bounce and actually make contact. That's very dangerous, uh, because uh, you can drop a piece of equipment and the relay can contact if it's still powered up with cables, and you can have something trigger that's not supposed to trigger, and that, that can be very dangerous. Uh, very small control voltages, so their microprocessor very friendly, and uh, they humidity. Uh, external magnetic fields, long storage times. Uh, these don't screw up the contacts or cause the, cause the magnetic coils to stop to fail to work correctly. The downside is of uh, semiconductor versus contacts is that, that, uh, that there is a little bit of on resistance that can generate heat. There, there's, a, there's no inductive noise, but there might be a little bit of junction noise. It's very low level, but, but, but it's there because it's a solid state device. And they may not be perfectly, uh, perfectly linear. There may be some, a uh, little bit of non-linearity as they, as they turn on and turn off. Uh, it's also possible for them to go through some spurious switching uh, with with, on various glitches. But the nice thing is they do not have bouncing contacts. And all relays bounce. Um, for relays, uh, the, they tend to fail open, but Solid state relays tend to fail shorted, and that's maybe a little bit of a concern. So if you have a device uh, that you couldn't tolerate it to fail shorted, you probably need to have two of these in series with each other so that one can fail, but the other would still work. 
Um, and they could be totally connected together. It would be easy to do. Uh, uh, they do have a pretty good uh, transient reverse recovery time. And uh, yeah. And they often will have this built in isolated supply. Um, okay. So uh, I think we talked about. Uh, okay. I'm going to do a little demo now. So let me do that. So we'll, we'll get rid of this. I'm going to put this back over here. And we'll do this and switch cameras. Now, here's the solid state relay. Now, you notice, um, well, here's my here's my, my two line by 16 display, which uh, you can't see now. But you can, I'll turn this off and then you'll be able to see it. Uh, well, yeah, you have to have, you have to do a little more work to make this work. But we'll get it here in two seconds with a little bit of extra light. I think. Yeah, let's see. Okay. I know I can do it. Maybe I have to make this a lot less. I don't know. I don't know why. I'm... So maybe I have to do this. Oh yeah, something like this. Maybe. set up earlier and now I can't get it back to where it was. Uh, hmm. Maybe I can do it by changing the brightness here. Oh yeah, there we go. All right, now you can see it. So uh, I'll start it over. So you get a little hello world and it goes through the letters. And uh, I'll show you on Friday, I'll do this a little bit more, but but what I want to really show is this, this is a, this, um, oh. So here's my, here's my relay. And actually I'm controlling this light, this one I've been moving around, I've been controlling with this. Um, and the positive is here. So when I pull this out, it goes off. And I thought I had it plugged into the, so you can see when, uh, so you can see when the uh, when the solid state relay cuts on. Yeah, I probably won't be able to show you all of it. When the solid state relay cuts on, then oh, so what's it doing? Oh, maybe. Okay, so if I if I plug this in. Here, I'll turn this back on. So if I if I plugged in the solid state relay, so on this end, I just have, uh, on this end I have um, 380 volts AC, up to 380 volts AC, and I believe it's uh, 25 amps. Um, you can kind of see it. 24 to 380 volts AC, and you can draw up to 25 amps. But on this side, I just have uh, 3 to 32 volts DC, and just a few milliamps. And so if I turn on, if I, if I drive it straight from, uh, I just plug it into the power pin, that turns it on, you can see the little light comes on, and then it, I turn on my, uh, my desk light here. So it easily controls the AC power to the desk light. Now, I had this thing, I don't know what it's doing. So you can see right now it's off, and then when it, Forget what's going on with that. Well, 
if I just put in one of the blink programs, I'll show you, I'll show you again on Thursday. But obviously, if I I I can easily control this with one of my with one of my GPIO pins. Just super easy to do. So that that turns it on and that turns it off. And uh, and I could I this light the my LED was blinking earlier and now it's not I don't, I don't know something happened. I guess I could reflash it, but I don't think I have the don't have the program up, so I won't bother. All right, I think I'm going to quit with that. Hopefully that's uh, interesting. Um, and we'll we probably won't do these in a lab, but uh, they're you know if you do want to do a, a final project where you control a more a higher powered device, it's easy to do. You can just use one of the solid state relays, and I have some you can borrow. They're not super cheap. They're maybe uh, you know. But the cheapest you can get them is maybe five or six bucks a pop, and you can pay, you can pay twenty bucks for one too, uh, depending on where you buy them for the same thing, really. Uh, but if you shop around, you can usually get them a little bit cheaper. Okay, so I think uh, with that, we'll we'll basically um, call it quits with that, and uh, then, like I said, this Friday we will do the LCD lab so try and pick up your LCD or if you don't get it by Friday come to the lab and pick one up Friday you don't have to stay you can just pick one up and go but uh, but and then I do want you to turn them back in because they do cost me about five bucks a pop and I hate to spend more money next semester so um, alright we will see everybody later